Welcome to our August Govern Stage Strategy Review. Um, just for a real quick overview of our org structure here, I'm leading the Govern Stage, and I'm also working on our Software Supply Chain Security Working Group. And then Derek is leading Compliance as our interim PM while we work to hire somebody into that role full-time. Um, Grant is working on our Security Policies Group, and Alana is in Threat Insights. Just for a real quick overview of our strategy here in terms of what markets and personas we're targeting, our largest market at, that we target is the application security testing market. Within that, we focus primarily on application security teams and development teams, although legal teams and compliance teams do also play a role in that as well. And we have some participation with infrastructure security teams. We do participate a little bit in the GRC market, which is governance, risk, and compliance. We do solve those concerns as far as they overlap with DevSecOps, but we're not trying to become a universal compliance solution or a solution that competes solely in that GRC market. The key difference there is a lot of GRC tools will take in data from a really wide variety of different applications to determine compliance. And we're focused primarily on compliance of the activities that are being done within GitLab. And then lastly is the ASOC market. We do play in this one to some extent as well by consolidating vulnerability data in GitLab. Um, again, we're not really a pure play in that market, especially as we don't do correlation right now, but we may add that in the future to expand our presence there. Coming out of this, we have a few roadmap themes for our three-year strategy. The first is top-down security controls. This helps security and compliance teams to manage all of their uh, security and compliance needs in a central location, so they don't have to do that project by project. Commonly, there's one security team or one compliance team for an entire organization, and it just doesn't scale well when you have thousands or tens of thousands of projects across GitLab, and so they need a way to manage those centrally. The second one is no compromises with compliance. So this is in order for compliance teams to use GitLab for enforcing compliance requirements, we have to make sure that those requirements, requirements are met 100% of the time and that we have the necessary tools to audit, monitor, and prove that. And so that means we can't have any comp compromises there. If there are workarounds or loopholes, it really tends to nullify the advantage of those features. The last one is coordinating security across GitLab. So this means taking advantage of all of the other things in the GitLab platform to provide for a seamless experience that brings those different personas together. So now that we've talked about some of the fundamental strategy principles guiding where we're going, let's talk about the more specific items that we have on our roadmap, as well as some highlights of the things that we've done in the recent past. Um, just this is our standard legal disclaimer to note that as we talk about the roadmap items, they are subject to change or delay. And so please do not rely on them for planning or purchasing purposes. Um, at a really high level, we actually have a huge number of features slated for the next three months. I'm not going to talk through all of these in detail because we'll talk through them here in the upcoming slides. Uh, but we have a really solid one year roadmap. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Derek to talk about compliance. All right. Thank you, Sam. Uh, so, yeah, the first thing that we're going to look at is some things that we've recently released. So we have recently released the audit event improvements. Uh, we've made several improvements here. Uh, so the first one is that you can now stream instance level audit events. And this uh, added to the top level groups uh, allows you to capture all the audit events that uh, can be produced uh, at every level since the uh, audit events from the projects and subgroups roll up to the top level groups and are reported through those streams. Uh, we've also added more options uh, to filter the audit events. And uh, with those, you can now look at uh, the audit event type. Uh, we're also planning on moving or adding more filters to this area in the future. So we'll be adding uh, things like project and uh, user and uh, more ways to filter to see the exactly the information that you need. Uh, in addition to that, we're also adding third-party 
uh, streaming locations for these audit events. Uh, that's something that we've already added uh, support for Google Cloud logging. And we're in the process of adding uh, Snowflake as well as several other uh, locations like Splunk and Datadog. All right, so the next thing that we have uh, done is that we've released a way to manage the compliance frameworks at the group level. Previously, you had to go to every single project in your group to uh, apply these frameworks. And when you have a very large set of projects, it can take a lot of time. So we've added ways to do this in bulk, uh, as well as filter uh, which projects you need and apply specific frameworks to those from the group level. Uh, and uh, the ability to add and edit compliance frameworks directly from this page, rather than having to switch over to the uh, group settings uh, to do that, that work. All right, so let's talk about what's next. Uh, the compliance adherence report is the big project that we're working on right now. So this will allow teams to look at exactly what's going on with their projects and how those projects comply with specific standards or regulations that are out there. Uh, so we'll allow users to drill into any of the different areas and see why maybe they failed or uh, partially failed and get right, uh, recommendations on why or how to fix that so that they can be compliant with those regulations. All right, and with that, I will pass it over to Grant. Thanks, Derek. I'll jump in as well, starting with uh, what we're working on actively and what's been recently released. Uh, so the first uh, topic I wanted to, to, to highlight is um, improved accuracy of our scan result policies. So we've been making some changes to our approval logic uh, to make sure that uh, when we require approvals, uh, the behavior is what our customers expect. There are some cases where they may uh, see an approval required when they don't expect that to be the case or vice versa. So to address this, what we're doing is, or what we have done now is um, update the logic to, con to consider um, all of the different pipeline sources, excluding parent-child pipelines. So the most common pipeline sources where we're running security scanners, where we're seeing customers run security scanners uh, that are related to the source and target branch. And we're looking at uh, latest completed pipelines specifically. And this will um, help us ensure that um, yeah, you know, the evaluation is is robust, considering more results, and that it's more accurate. So we think this is going to capture probably eighty plus percent of the inaccuracies we're seeing, and we're going to continue to iterate in this area. And the next topic I wanted to touch on uh, is something that's in development, but very close. We've been working on this for some time, and uh, I think I think our customers are going to be really excited about it, which is um, adding some more granular uh, filters to our scan result uh, uh, policies. And um, what this will do is allow you to filter out a lot of the noisy vulnerabilities that are not actionable, um, such as by uh, setting an age filter uh, based on say the severity of the vulnerability, you can uh, set an SLA before we start to block uh, merge requests where we find uh, such results, or if we detect false positives or uh, vulnerabilities where a fix is not yet available. Customers can use these these uh, options to kind of toggle and filter more of these vulnerabilities out and free up their security team to focus only on what is really addressable. So we're targeting uh, this milestone 16.3 to complete it, but it is uh, it's still an active development. And then moving on, um, the scan result policy type, we're actually going to be uh, freshening it up a bit. Uh, you might see this called the merge request approval policy here very soon. Um, and we're going to be focusing a lot more on the compliance enforcement aspect by introducing a new, um, a new uh, capability um, as a result. This will be a new way to use uh, a merge request approval policy that will allow you to um, ensure that we are doing two-person approvals on all MRs. So you can target any merge request and then require um, uh, approvals from a particular role, for example, like maintainer or developer. And then another, another uh, component of this effort is to also close any gaps uh, so that we can ensure compliance, uh, make, it, make sure that the policies that are set, um, that they are always uh, addressed, that they're always being met. And a couple of things that um, you might see in project settings are the ability to unprotect branches or rename branches 
or manage settings around force pushes. And with the security policy, uh, the merge request approval policies, you'll be able to um, override these settings and ensure that um, you know we're always able to require um, the particular approvals and that there's not a way to circumvent the policies. And the last one I want to highlight is um, also much anticipated uh, is the ability to um, to in the future unify uh, some of our I guess two capabilities that we have today in GitLab, which is compliance pipelines and security policies. Uh, we're going to be introducing support for custom YAML to be able to kind of execute these compliance pipelines in the background through a, uh, a security policy. And the other component of this is improving the usability. So you can actually define, we'll be able to define the scope of a policy uh, to target projects with a particular compliance framework label. And it'll make it a lot simpler to kind of link these policies up to a compliance framework and get a, a clear understanding of which policies will take effect for a given set of projects and scope of that compliance framework. Um, so yeah, that covers it for security policies. I'll kick it over to Alana with Thread Insights. Hi, so let's uh, get started. So we recently released the group dependency list for the group and subgroup levels. Um, I'll talk about some iterations that are coming in quick succession, but this will give users the ability to see everything um, within a group or all, all their different projects so they have that higher level overview rather than going project by project. And we uh, recently shipped um, Explain This Vulnerability with AI. Um, this is still in the experiment phase, but we will be shipping to beta in 16.3. Um, we have been slowly releasing beta related features like showing the prompt um, and then also like a quick um, check for potentially exposing secrets and sending them to AI. We've been slowly rolling that out, um, but we are expecting beta in 16.3. And the goal with this is to help up-level developers to improve their skills um, and help them write more secure code. So like I mentioned in a quick succession of the MVC iteration that we just released for the group dependency list, we are gonna go back and add license and vulnerability information. And we also are going to enhance what is available for searching and filtering on these dependencies. Eventually, um, we are going to support this at the organization level. So that way um, organizations can see if they have a dependency that might be super risky like log4j. And we are getting really close to having this work complete for custom security um, team roles. So we wanna make sure that uh, customers are able to give their users the, um, the least privileges for their different projects. So for example, a lot of, we're hearing from a lot of customers that they don't want developers to be able to change the vulnerability status. So we're gonna be in 17.0, we are gonna make that a breaking change and remove that from that option from developers. And then um, ultimate customers that have access to these customizable roles will be able to create a new role um, with reporter as the base that adds things specific to their security teams who don't necessarily need to be changing code, but do need that change vulnerability status. And um, very exciting, we will be expanding on options for searching and filtering. Um, it's great to know that GitLab is scanning for all different types of vulnerabilities, but it's also important to be able to have that level of fidelity to be able to find um, what, you are, what you're looking for and be able to triage. So we are going to um, add filtering so you can easily chain multiple filtering criteria. Right now we have some of those options, but it's a little bit limited. So we will be adding to that um, and we're getting started by um, adding the group by. So um, hopefully that will, that work is gonna start soon and um, the um, we'll see that sooner as the first thing rather than later. 
And in addition to explain this vulnerability going to beta, we are working on another experiment that would suggest a fix for vulnerability. You can see in this slide, this looks a lot like explain this vulnerability, but we do have two buttons um, on that drawer to create the, an MR with the AI solution. So this will give development teams a, and security teams a more efficient way to mitigate these vulnerabilities by getting them started with a suggestion. And Sam, back to you for software supply chain security. All right, thanks. Thanks, Alana. Uh, we have a lot of features coming up there. For software supply chain security, this is a working group that we have within the governed stage. We recently released support for keyless signing, which has some huge benefits in terms of making it uh, significantly more simple for developers to begin signing their build artifacts, their container images, and their packages that they build as part of CI CD. I provided a few slides on the details of that in the appendix. It was too in depth to go into for this presentation, but the net result is that users can now add just a few lines, an ID tokens line, which generates a SIG store ID token that's automatically read by Cosign, which can then be used to sign their artifacts. So it's a huge improvement and it eliminates the need to manage a separate key management system, uh, wrote, you know, eliminates the need to create and rotate your keys and simplifies the solution of how to verify things because you no longer have to figure out how to distribute your public key. Coming up next, we are getting close to having support for automatic commit signing. This would benefit commits made through the web UI. Um, they're already automatically signed with an SSH key. We're in the process of rolling that out. Uh, and then self-managed users will be able to choose whether they want the automatic signing to be done using OpenPGP or SSH for their commits. Coming up next, we're working to improve the way we show the verification status of those signatures in the UI. As right now, those signatures are not connected in any way with their container images. So it's a little bit of a painful process currently to do that verification. So we're planning to, instead of showing the signature on a separate line item in the container registry, we're planning to add this badge right alongside the container image where users can immediately see if it's signed or not, what the verification status is of that, and then they can click in and view all the details of that signature. Shifting to our roadmap, just to show where we're at and where we're headed, that top row of keyless signing, those are all things that we just shipped in 16.2. Um, in the future, we're working on this signature verification in the UI for containers. We plan to eventually provide similar verification in other areas too, such as packages and build artifacts. Um, also, we plan to eventually uh, begin signing the attestation that we're generating and improve the contents of the attestations as well. Uh, with that, we'll shift it over to any questions that you may have during our synchronous Q&A. If you're watching this async, please feel free to drop any questions that you have asynchronously into the document ahead of time. Thanks for watching today. Have a great day.